Okay, thanks you, Sebastian, and thanks for the invitation. Let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, you should see the presentation. Can you see the presentation also in full screen mode? Or you just see the... Yeah, it's good. The, it's full screen now. Is it full screen? Okay. So thanks for the invitation. I am Andres Antilli, a PhD student at Gladia, so against the University of Rome. Uh, Gladia is a research lab in artificial intelligence and also a contributor of big science. Uh, big Science is a one-year-long research workshop sponsored by Agenface on language models. And today I'm going to talk to you about this work done at the Prompt Engineering Working Group that is called Multitask Prompt Training Enables Zero-Shot Task Generalization. So before going into the, de the details of this work, let's have a recap of what happened in natural language processing so we can start from the fact that large language models have been shown to attain zero shot generalization and in particular i'm talking of gpt3 so what is a language model we can see um, down here an example of language mo language model in particular gpt2 gpt2 is a transformer neural model based on the decoder transform architecture and this model is trained simply to predict the next word given the previous one. And it turns out if you do this on a large collection of data that could be Wikipedia or a large portion of textual data of the web, you can have an interesting textual representation that you can use for your downstream tasks. So for example, in this case, recite the first law, we have the model that given this special character continues the, the sentence uh, for us. So up to GPT-2, the main way to fine tune a model and to use the model for your downstream tasks was uh, using GPT-2 to fine tune uh, that model on a particular data set. Let's say I want to translate um, uh, English to French. And I have a data set of uh, per example, per sentences of English sentence and uh, English and French sentences. So what they do in this case is simply I take these data, data sets and fine tune my model in a supervised fashion. At the end, after n step of gradient updates, I can use uh, uh, the model to perform new prediction, in this case, new translation from uh, English to French. However, what has been popularized by GPT-3 instead is another way of performing uh, translation and performing learning that in this case, in this example, is zero-shot learning. That means I specify the task as input, for example, in natural language, like translate English to French, and I ask the model to give me the translation for a particular word in this case, a particular English word. So uh, GPT, in the paper of GPT-3, they show that increasing the number of parameters is strictly correlated with the accuracy on that tasks. This means that the, the largest version of GPT-3, that is 175 billion, is able to outperform a fine-tuned state-of-the-art model um, on that specific task. This is the case for uh, trivia question answering, that is a question answering data set, but, but in the paper of GPT-3, there are also other examples of this kind of correlation within the number of parameters and the accuracy. So in this case, the model was the one-shot model to outperform the fine-tuned state of the art. So one, one may ask the question, uh, is it really the number of parameters that allow to achieve this zero-shot learning? Is it really implicit, implicit this zero-shot learning? Uh, is it an emergent property of the number of parameters or there is something else maybe in the training procedure? So if you look carefully at the data that is raw data and annotated from the web, 
we can see that, for example, data from website like Quora, Stack Overflow, or forums already are in the form of uh, a natural language processing specification tasks. Let's say you search on Quora, that is the question, and I have the answer soon after. So in some way, there is some trends now on how to instruct a model to perform a particular task in natural language directly in the training data sets of GPT-3. So the question that we posed was, can instead uh, directly induce this zero-shot generalization by explicit multitask learning? So I think there is an answer in chat. Uh, it's just me advertising the GPT-3 ah, okay. party that we had in December because okay. it was closely connected to the topic you're discussing now. Okay, sorry. So the question was, can we instead directly induce this generalization via multitask training? So we started with a pre-trained transformer model that is T5. So T5 is a language model like GPT-2. It's an encoder-decoder model and it's pre-trained on a large collection of texts from the web in a self-supervised way. So we started from T5 and decided to fine-tune T5 on a set of uh, different tasks uh, in a human-readable, printable format. So let's say let's see what this means. So for example, I have um, a task of summarization. This task can be rephrased in a printable format in this uh, in this way. I have the the main document, for example, the picture up here, blah blah blah, and then I have my instruction to the model. How will you rephrase that in a few words? So I convert the tasks in a natural language processing task in a printable format. That means that I convert the the task in a way that is understandable to a human and also to a model. I like talk to the model and ask to the model to perform the tasks. So another, another group of uh, um, tasks that we performed for the fine tuning is the paraphrase identification. In this case, uh, the model is asked given two sentences to say if the second sentence is a paraphrase of the first one. So one way to perform these tasks is ask the model, for example, how is air traffic control? How, how do you become an air traffic controller? And this is the second sentence. And then you ask, pick one, this question or duplicates, or not duplicates. And the other set of tasks could be question answering where we have a paragraph and then a question about something that is in that paragraph and ask the model to answer the question. So in this case, the model was called T0 because is the same architecture of T5, but is fine-tuned by multitask learning in this large mixture of tasks to perform zero-shot learning, to perform zero-shot generalization. So what we did, we, we fine-tuning the T5, and also we held out um, a set of tasks and data sets to perform the evaluation phase for the zero-shot generalization. So the first thing, that we have to do is to create a system to convert uh, natural language tasks into a human readable prompts into a human readable format and we'll see how and then there was a large collaborative effort of different contributors all over the world to convert to convert a large sets of supervised data sets into printable format at the end once we have this, uh, this data set, we simply fine tune the T5 model on this mixture of tasks. So um, the uh, conversion to a printable format works in the following way. Let's say I have these data sets that is a uh, paraphrase data sets. And an example of these data sets, let's say item consists of two sentences, two questions, and then a label that says is a paraphrase or not a paraphrase. So, one prompt could be this one on the right, that is, I received the questions, question one and question two, are they duplicates? And then ask the model to output yes or no. But this is, this is just an example. Another example could be, I give the model question one and question two, and then ask the model, pick one, this question are duplicates or not duplicates, and ask the model to 
response like not duplicate or duplicate. So there could be a different way to prompt um, a question and an item to, to do to the model. And these are just two examples. Another way to prompt the model for a kind of data sets, in this case, the summarization could be I provide the, the model, the, the document that should be summarized, and then ask the model, how would you rephrase that in a few words? But another possible prompt is first, please read the article below, and you provide the article. How can you write me a short abstract for it? So it's like uh, talking to another person and uh, asking that person to perform that task for you. And the same thing can be done also for question answering. So this tool is called Prompt Source, and it's uh, an open source tool to convert uh, any data sets in natural language processing to a printable format. And this tool is available online. So you can use the, the tool. You, you select the data set that you want to convert, the subset of that data sets. And on the left, uh, you have also um, a preview of what is the format, the JSON format of your data sets. So the main thing that you have to do in order to convert uh, data sets in a printable uh, format is to write this template here. Basically, the template specify like uh, an expression on how to convert each sample of that data set to a printable format. So in this case, are, are the following sentences equivalent or not equivalent? And then we give sentence one and sentence two. And this is just a convenient markup language to allow the fast conversion of, of all the items in the data set. So once you specify this template, you can convert all the element in the data set in a printable format. And the conversion is done automatically by the, the tool. So this was the main effort of the main uh, effort for these um, for these uh, data sets for the construction of these data sets that is called a public pool of prompts P3, and uh, they were involved more than 36 contributors affiliated with 24 different institutions in eight countries, and uh, a total number of 165 data sets were converted to a printable format, but each data set was converted to different prompts. That means that there were around 10 different original prompts per data set. And so this increased a lot, like the number of templates and also the number of example per data sets. So what we do, what we did next was to use a portion of this public pool of prompts to, to fine tune our T5 model zero shot generalization in particular we selected a collection of these uh, data sets the the one that i yellow in the picture to perform the fine tuning procedure among these there are data sets for multiple choice question answering that are all these data sets in a yellow box extractive question answering also summarization privacy identification Topic classification, that is a task that consists in given a text, by the text, uh, for example, news in sport news, uh, 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 I don't know, politics, and so on, and also for the Wikipedia article. So there are different kind of tasks that, tasks that range from multiple choice and question answering to classification. And all these tasks were used for the fine tuning of T5 and the, the resulting model T0, while the, the, the green box on the right contains all the tasks that were used just for the evaluation so that the model has never seen before during the training procedure. So in this case, we have different data sets that range from uh, language inference tasks. That is a task that given to sentences, we ask simply to say that so to say if they are in entailment or not, or other tasks like sentence completion, we ask the model to complete a sentence to see if it has acquired like common sense. And then there is uh, this last column that is called big bench. This big bench is uh, an external benchmark. Also, this one is a collaborative effort. 
to collect the different data sets to specifically test models for zero shot generalization. So we used uh, 14 tasks from Big Bench to test uh, the generalization capability of the model. So in the first uh, set of experiment, we asked whether this zero shot generalization can be directly induced by this explicit multitask training. And uh, we um, basically compare different models. The first is the T5, uh, the T5 model that is T0 without fine tuning. The second model is T0 that is basically five fine tuned on the selection of tasks from P3 that I showed you before. T0 plus that is basically T0 plus some data sets from the GPT-3's evaluation suite. And this was done to put uh, T0 and GPT-3's on the same playing field. And also T0++ that used the same data of T0++ uh, with also super glue that is a benchmark for uh, um, comparing uh, language models. So we can see here the results on the first set of uh, tasks and these are all held out tasks so our performance at uh, zero shot so uh, we can see that the model t0 that is the the dark um, the dark green here is able on all the tasks for example of number language inference to outperform both uh, gpt3 and also the the variant that is um T5, the, the, the corresponding model not trained on this multi multitask mixture of tasks. So um, another thing that we note is that the, the, the largest version of the GPT-3 is 175 billion parameters, while T0 was able to perform GPT-3 with just 11 parameters in the zero shot fashion. We have also other tasks like word sense disambiguations, and also coreference resolution, where the model is comparable to GPT-3. And in total, in this set of experiment, T0 was able to perform GPT-3 on nine over 11 tasks. We can see also the, the performance on the big bench uh, benchmark for zero shot generalization. And in this case, the model T0, T0 plus, and T0 plus plus are compared with uh, uh, language models, uh, not of the size of GPT-3, but equivalent to GPT-3. And these language models were used for the evaluation phase of uh, Big Bench and were provided by the Big Bench authors. And so also in this case, we can see that the model is able to perform on 13 over 14 tasks, uh, the, the model, the baseline models that were provided by the big bench maintainers. And this was our first question, whether zero shot generalization can be used by multitask learning. Another question, another such question was, does this training on a wider range of prompts improve robustness to prompt learning? Because there are different ways to formulate a prompt and each person could decide to formulate a prompt in a different and creative way. So we want to test two ablation experiments. That is the first one varying the number of prompts per data sets. And the second is varying the number of data sets used. So in the first experiment, we can see the same data sets of before but this time tested with different prompt per data sets. In this case, there are results for a zero prompt. So it's the model without fine tuning with one prompt, the red box, uh, 5.7 prompt, the yellow box, and 8.03, uh, the green box. So we can see that increasing the number of prompt per data sets result also in increase of the median accuracy per task and also in a decrease of the variance per task. Similar pattern can be observed also 
uh, increasing instead the number of data sets during the training procedure, the fine tuning procedure. So in this case, you can see that the median accuracy per task increased, but the variance remains more or less the same. So the model uh, T0 is available online to be downloaded. And also if you click the, the link, you can also play with the model and use the model because there is on, on the right an inference API where you can find, uh, uh, for example, a set of uh, example like sentiment analysis. In this case, we instruct the model, is this a review positive or negative? And then we give the review. So you can use the model and specify, instruct the model to solve your task and uh, see uh, how it works. And this is true both for T0++, that is T0PP, and also for T0, standard T0 and T0+. There is also a smaller version of 3 billion parameters that can be used also on your local machine. Other artifacts that were produced during this work were the dataset P3, that is these datasets of public prompts, and uh, also the prompt source tool that can be used to convert any dataset to a promptable format. So I think to have in mind is that this model is not perfect. And of course, the pre-training procedure uh, includes some bias that are in the data like gender bias and also can give a false answer and harmful answer to open-end questions so please be careful of how to uh, on how you use the the model so in conclusion the first question was can zero shot generalization be directly induced by explicit multitask training and the answer is yes we showed that T0 was able to perform GPT-3 on nine out 11 tasks, despite being 16 times smaller than GPT-3. And we show also that T0 attains strong performance on 13 out of 14 big batch tasks, a benchmark specific for zero shot. The second research question was, does training on a wider range of prompts improve robustness to prompt wording? And in this case, also, the answer is yes, and we show that training of more prompts per data sets improves the median and also decrease the variability when we have more prompts. While training on a wider range of data sets also generally improves the median, but do not decrease the variability. So this work is available on archive where you can find all the details for the training parameters, cyber parameters, and other details. And there is also a blog, a blog post on big science. So what is uh, big science briefly? So big science is a one year long research workshop, a large multilingual models and data sets. So the idea, the idea was to build something like CERN or LAC for AI. So this means that, for example, um, working with a large language model it's uh, starting to be very difficult for small groups, small research groups, and also institutions. So a large collaboration might be needed to train and investigate this model. Uh, so the workshop is um, an open science workshop. This means that it is like um, uh, an open source uh, project, but for research. So you can join the workshop. There are different working groups working on different things and different aspects of natural language processing that could be multilinguality, data sets, interpretability, visualization, and other things. So I suggest you to take a look at the website and take a look at the, the workshop if you are interested in this topic. In particular, if you are interested in the, what was the topic of this talk, I suggest you to take a look at the prompt engineering working group and thank you. I would like to thank all the organizers of uh, Big Science, uh, Pi School for the invitations, and all the contributors that made this work uh, possible. And thanks, of course, for your attention.
Great. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks so much. This is really interesting stuff. Um, we we have a bit of time for your questions, dear audience. Yeah. So why don't you write down your uh, at least uh, raise your hand sort of virtually in the in the chat so we can call up people if that's too many, if that's too few, then uh, just uh, unmute yourself and speak. Um, I have, uh, while people get ready, I have already one short to answer question, I guess, which is um, yeah. what version of GPT-3 did you specifically compare to? Question comes from the fact that if you remember at the time of the hack party we had in December, uh, OpenAI had just uh, released the Da Vinci Instruct V3 model, which is the one which, is, uh, which performs best on engineered prompts. So, which yeah. is kind of like fine tuned for exactly the zero shot uh, uh, and transfer uh, uh, transfer learning tasks that you are discussing here. So, which is the version of GPT three that you compare to? Okay, I think that most of the results are directly from the paper of GPT three, okay. so are from the paper. But for the other results, I think is the Da Vinci without this rock. For example, for the Big Bench. Uh, no, I think Big Bunch didn't use the GPT-3, so it's just from the paper. So they, they you took, I mean, the, the working group took the, uh, the, didn't redo the experiments with, uh, with a GPT-3 model, but instead took the statistics, the, the evaluations from the paper. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so, because also the, the model T0 plus use the, the same evaluation suite of GPT-3 to put uh, GPT-3 and uh, T0 plus on the same playing field. And that, that's the reason. Makes sense, thank you. But I might be wrong, I double check. Mm -hmm. No problem, thanks. Okay, we don't have that many questions. So anyone who's got one, you just unmute yourself and go. Ah. Uh, Norman has one. Okay. Norman, do you want to unmute yourself and speak? And then I think Cristiano has one. Or I can read the, the question. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm moving. I'm on the road, so probably it's a bit noisy. That's why I, I brought it. But I didn't want to miss the, the talk, so I'm, I'm listening while I'm walking. Uh, cool. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me, if it's too noisy. Anyway, yeah. No, was, no, it's fine. Cool, yeah. <clears throat> I was very curious about, uh, like, what does the future of research look like for NLP? You mentioned you mentioned uh, CERN, like a collaboration of a lot of labs, and it looks like indeed to do this kind of NLP research, you either go big or you go home. And it also looks like these models are kind of solving a lot of other problems that uh, previously you needed to like uh, find to a single solution for. So it, yeah, like. What do you think the future looks like for this kind of research? Yeah, thanks, uh, Norman, for, for the question. So um, I think that in natural language processing, this is just a, a small part of natural language processing. That means that there are also other tasks that are smaller and can be targeted by smaller group. I mean, language models are not the 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 only tasks in natural language processing, but it's the, the most tight task right now. So certainly um, there should be open collaboration like this one for working on large language models because, because it's very difficult to, to train these models and to have resources to train these models. Uh, not just the, 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 the money, the resources part, but it's also difficult to the engineering part. For example, in the big science workshop, there is a team that is trying to replicate the results of GPT-3 for a multilingual model. And uh, it's, uh, it is experiencing a lot of um, error and training instabilities. So it's, um, it's, it, it's difficult also the, the scaling thing of this uh, cross-formal model. So for me, uh, the the research direction will be like trying to replicate results of these large models in a smaller scale, but we need open large collaboration to perform uh, 
uh, experiment of GPT-3 scale. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Norman. Thanks, Cristiano. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for, for the talk. Mine was just a curiosity. Uh, in yeah. the past, I was working on uh, word sense disambi disambiguation. And so you mentioned it. Uh, and I was curious about uh, which kind of uh, data set, uh, if you are aware of, of it, uh, are, um, are used now to test, um, to test word sense disambiguation. Or if there are some, some ways, new ways to do it. I'm just curious. OK. Thanks for the question, Cristiano. So um, I'm not really deep in word sense disambiguation, so I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of this state of the art in word sense disambiguation. But for example, the, the, the result that I show you in the slide, maybe I represent the, the slide. Yeah, the, the result was, was, uh, was the one was, where yeah, the yeah. We're close, close, uh, were close by GPT-3 and uh, T5. Yeah, th this one is like particularly curious because we can see that T0 and also T5 mm. have, let's say, 50 and 60 um, accuracy of performance while GPT-3 is very low. So I think that one of the reason is due oh, to okay. the, the architecture because, uh, for example, GPT-3 is just a decoder so as just the attention from one side, while the T5 and T0 is an encoder and decoder architecture. So basically your encode, your task definition and your prompt with the encoder, and then leave the, the decoder just for the generation of the answer uh, of the model. So this might be a reason because for worse sense disambiguation, uh, the context means a lot. I mean, the context define what is the word sense that you associate to that particular word. So with um, bi-directional context for the, um, for the example that you provide an input and you ask, given this example and given this second example, are they the same word sense or something like that? It's, it's very important to have this bi-directional context. So um, I, I cannot answer 100% your question about word sense disambiguation because I'm not aware of the, the state of the art for a zero shot and also other data sets. Uh, maybe, maybe I can ask some colleagues that work with uh, Robert Naviria. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. We've got an extra question from Adrian. Gonna, I, gonna comment on your question, Adrian. Hey. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'll just read it. Um, so, um, yeah, I was just curious for people who might be interested in hugging face and uh, big science in particular. Uh, would you mind sharing some some of your experiences working? How how, how did you find working there? Um, yeah, in, in just any general um, experiences of yours. Okay. Yes. So there are different working groups in big science. So the first thing that you have to do is decide which working group you, work, you want to work on. So for example, you're interested in uh, data sets, in visualization. And so once you decide that, you can join the working group that basically consists in joining the, the Slack channel. So the effort that you put in the project, basically it's up to you. So you decide if you want to participate to each, um, for example, weekly call of that particular working group because there is one call per week, generally for each working group. So the idea in that case that it's a very synchronous activity where each week you decide together with uh, the colleague in chat is like how to proceed for, for that project, for that working group. And this is uh, how most of the working groups work. But there are also other working groups like, um, um, for example, the prompt engineering that made uh, something different, like they made a hackathon to, to perform this 
a large labeling and conversion to a printable format of data sets. So in that case, the main way to join maybe is through, through pull request and the issue. And so in that case, the, the working is more asynchronous and you can convert uh, the data set so you can do the tasks that was assigned to you through GitHub issues. So it really depends on the working group and uh, who is chairing the working group. I suggest you to join this live challenge and just see what is going in the channel and then decides how you want to be involved. If you want, you can write some, you can write something in chat and, and that's it. That, that's my experience. I prefer, if I may say, I prefer the asynchronous format through GitHub issues uh, and assignment of uh, issues. And so this is genuinely an open source initiative based on what you're saying. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. That's super interesting, actually, that something like this is happening open source. Yeah. You can see there are different also on YouTube, on YouTube different events of uh, big science where they talk about how it works, uh, what are they doing in the different working groups. And if you go on YouTube, but also on the website of big science, you can see the latest updates from the different working groups and decide uh, what to do. Awesome, thanks. I have one more question, Andrea, just on that topic of um, yeah, uh, of collaboration in this uh, setting. Um, how how do the working groups or how does the project in general deal with the I would say somewhat sometimes at least touchy issue of academic credit assignment? i.e. authorship of, say, a paper or of a post or something. Um, because there are so many people and because the uh, working group is open, there are very diverse levels of participation and hence of uh, genuine intellectual contribution to a given project. How is that regulated? And I mean by that also socially. A bit like, you know, in, okay, I okay, mean, like Wikipedia yeah. is socially engineered for some purposes. For example, in this case, for this uh, paper, the, the academic attribution was you convert uh, a number of uh, data sets to printable format and you have your name on the paper. Then you can decide to be involved in other activities like the engineering part, the, I don't know, the writing of the paper and so on. But this is the case for the prompt engineering working group. How don't, I, I don't know how it works for the other working groups, but um, it's different from this thing because the other working groups use the other synchronous activities like calls, weekly calls. So I know that, for example, the um, interpretability working groups made a survey on language models and training dynamics on language models, uh, but I don't know how they, they made the, the choice for the for the authorship. I think it's anonymous now. Interesting. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that at the end of the workshop, there will be a final publication with all the all the workshop, what happened in the workshop, and that will be like an oral publication with all the people involved. But there are also different um different aspects different paper artifacts that came out from the the working groups but i don't know how they are attributed to the the authors thank you any more questions okay we've got three more minutes so i'll produce another question nice uh, <laughs> And that is, do you have anything to say about um, about compute, about the engineering side of, uh, uh, of uh, fine tuning these models, especially with regards to the setup of the big science initiative? So, you know, how how was the how big was the compute involved to start with? Um, did it pose any uh, specific challenges? And did you have any original ways in the in the project to solve these? 
right? So I don't have all the updates for the fine tuning uh, procedure. I mean, uh, there are different working groups and there is a working group working on model engineering that is specifically designed for addressing all the problems related to training. And I'm not in that working group. And I also know that, for example, for training these models, there were some resources in France from the supercomputer Jean Z that were through a grant from Agrinface. But to use that resources, you need to be in French. And I think that you should be one in, in Agrinface in the organization. So you can't directly train with uh, shared resources that were assigned to another organization. So in, in certain sense, the, the training is performed by other entities and what you do during the course is discussing how to do the, the training. Okay, get it. Thank you. Okay, so it's uh, it's time to wrap up already. So many thanks, Andrea, for the for coming to give this talk. Uh, Thank it was you. really interesting. I think we are looking forward for the uh, for the next episodes of this work. It's uh, it it will go on, I imagine. For I mean, it's not done yet. It's not over yet. Uh, so I suspect yeah. the work of the working groups is uh, carrying on. So we're really looking forward for more news from that. Yeah, I, Thank I, you can again. Anticipate it, I can anticipate you something like that in the prompt engineering working group. We are working in another version of the data sets. So we are, converted, we are converting other data sets and also multilingual data sets. Uh, but beautiful. that's for the, the, the prompt engineering. So there yeah. are also other news from the other working groups. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for inviting me. Thank you again. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.